Hiya. Um, I hear often people talking about high function and low function autism and everyone focuses on autism. What I rarely hear about or anyone discusses is the comorbids associated with autism which for me I would say impacts much more than autism itself. Many people don't realise that when you get an autism diagnosis that isn't all that is there. You have things like sensory processing disorder, hypermobility, food sensitivities, food allergies. Um, with the hypermobility you could have hypermobility EDS. Um, there's neurological issues, there's immune issues, there's absorption issues of um, magnesium, iron, B12, to name a few. Then along with the hypermobility later on in your life, there's a possibility of osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia. And it's as though all the adults who have autism can see the links between this condition and that condition in autism but professionals seem to bury their head in the sand about it so some professionals will agree that food allergies um, are linked to autism and they will um, agree that it affects behavior then you will meet another professional say actually no it has no bearing whatsoever then you have the majority of counties not assessing, commissioning sensory processing disorder assessments, even though it seems to be a foundational stone for it, um, because they know if they assess for SPD and children have it, then it's likely they will have some sort of spectrum disorder coming behind it. So you can see the logic. If we don't assess for it, we won't find it. If we don't find it, then we're unlikely to see or diagnose a child early enough, which means it's not going to cost us money. Then you've got the issues with hypermobility, the joint issues, the pain issues, um, difficulty walking, the W position and what that problems that causes for children. So you can imagine if we are already quite anxious that's the way we work um some of some people on the autistic spectrum have high adrenaline levels just as a norm and anything when it lowers means they'll do things to make their adrenaline level go back up um and we're so we're, we're, we've got emotional vulnerability sitting right there then we've got extra um, stress coming from the community, from people's perceptions, judgments, assumptions, the way they speak to us. But just imagine, rather than focusing on autism and the meltdowns and the issues around that, and making children conform through ABA-type therapies where they're made to behave and go against everything that their neurology and biology is, so, for instance, made to eat things that they physically, mentally and emotionally can't stomach because society says so. Yeah, or you, we will flood you and you will cope. And if you don't cope, we'll punish you for it. So we'll take away what matters to you and you won't get what matters to you until you do as we say. That's like forced conformity. It's come from based from Dr. Lovas, who was, well, I won't even go there with him. However, imagine... If a child was assessed for sensory processing disorder and it was found that they were, uh, they were either sensory seeking or sensory avoidant or a mixture of the both, then a sensory diet was created to help that child manage that sensory processing disorder. There reduces emotional vulnerability. Imagine if the food sensitivities and allergies were identified those antagonistics removed from their diet and replaced with foods or things that were less antagonistic, again, lowering the emotional vulnerability and reactivity. Imagine if their immune issues were dealt with. Imagine if with the hypermobility, if EDS was identified and screened for, those issues were dealt with and managed and monitored. Imagine if the hypermobility were given the appropriate exercises to build muscle tone so they weren't in pain. Again, 
emotional vulnerability reduced. So whilst everyone talks about autism and the meltdowns and what an issue it is and how hard it is and how the schemas are difficult, the rigidity is difficult, you've got to remember a lot of the behaviours that children do are self-regulatory. So they're not an issue for the child because the child is regulating themselves or the adult is regulating themselves. It's an issue for everyone else around the child because it interferes with what they want in life and what they perceive others perceive as abnormal. But in reality, if people helped with the comorbids, if the NHS, the local authorities and the health professionals worked as a team, rather than burying their head in the sand or attacking the parents seeking support, but actually helped with the comorbids, which were increasing the emotional vulnerability, increasing the potential for reactivity, and rather than focusing on conformity, were focusing on tools to help regulate that emotional vulnerability, what a difference that would make. The potential difference would be amazing. Now, for instance, how many people know that there's a condition called Ireland Syndrome? Did you know that if you had glasses, proper Ireland glasses, that could actually affect your sensory processing issues? and some physiological issues. You may think I'm joking. The only reason I can say this is from experience. I was given coloured glasses from an ophthalmologist. I was constantly getting migraines and I couldn't bear wearing them because all I could see was pink. Then I was assessed for Ireland, found I had Ireland. The lenses went on, and I'm not joking you, when the correct lens went on, my hearing physically changed. I can't describe it, it just did. Can you imagine if conditions were identified and managed simple things like a sensory diet, uh, a healthy um, diet um, of foods which were not antagonising the gut, where the gut flora was healthy, which would then also promote um, a better um, concentration for the child they'd be less reactive to foods so less off the wall if you like again all that is reducing the emotional vulnerability improving the quality of life of the person and allowing them the opportunity to access the strengths that they have because one of the things about the comorbids is it affects your ability to function at a certain level so you may be classed as high functioning but if the comorbids are out of whack and the stress is there, your ability to be high functioning decreases. Your executive functioning skills decrease. Your ability to do day-to-day -day things decrease. And people, I often hear it's all about autism. Autism, autism. That is our neurology. That is the way we think, the way we have a perception around us, our ability to see detail, our analytical minds. Our, that is strengths there. But the comorbids don't allow us to access it. The comorbids increase our emotional vulnerability, impact our mental health, never mind having to do with everybody else's opinions, judgments and assumptions thrown in on the deep end. And then when your child is struggling, you've then that got to deal with as well. Now, many people go, oh, don't want to hear this. But then there's another interesting fact, which for me is quite significant. I would hesitate to guess that most NHS professionals know the links. And I don't think it's any sort of accident that since EHCPs have been introduced and parents are seeking support for their children, autistic adults are being targeted. There's a lady called Chancer who has basically stated anyone with an ASD diagnosis or the comorbids, funnily enough, is red flagged straight away for FII, which is fabricated illness, straight away you're flagged. So, so just imagine any of your children now, in the future, if they seek support for their kids, has the potential to be accused of FII simply because they have an ASD diagnosis. What I find interesting is what she lists alongside that ASD diagnosis is the comorbids known to ASD. Then you look at, since the EHCPs have been introduced, there's been an increase in safeguarding allegations made against parents and an increase in FII accusations. 
I don't think that's an accident. Then you look at another interesting sort of quirk that parents who are home educating children with ASD who do not seek interventions via the NHS but go privately and do it do not experience the same level of threats and accusations as those who seek the support via the NHS. Why? Why is that? For me, it's the knowledge that those comorbids affect us quite a lot. That requires interventions. You can imagine we've got immune issues, we've got gut issues, we've got joint issues, we've got connective tissue issues, we've got um, the difficulties with our magnesium, B12, iron um, absorption, which affect our serotonin levels, which affect our mental health, affect our ability to do a lot of things basically, like sleep. And it's amazing how those small nutrients that we can't absorb affect our ability to sleep. Um, and the, you can imagine they know that any chess aren't daft, the local authorities aren't daft, that when we're seeking support for the comorbids, that that's going to cost them money. So what's the easiest way to make everybody back off? Well, we'll threaten the parent, we'll accuse the parents, and we'll put them back in their box, and then they'll behave themselves. But in reality, all that's doing is creating a disaster for later on, because all these children who are not being cared for, not being receiving the right therapies and the right support, will, as adults, be in a, a very difficult position, uh, won't be reaching their potential. We are just recreating the cycle that we've got now. Unless we start supporting the children with the comorbids to allow them to um, manage the emotional vulnerability that comes with it and the reactivity and the physical problems that come with it and the physical disabilities that come along with it, especially in later life, um, nothing's going to change. We need to stop focusing on autism as it, the label but actually look deeper than that. So look at the comorbids, look at how that's impacting our um, children's health and us as adults' health. Look at how we can support, look at providing tools for coping. You know, a sensory diet isn't food related, a sensory diet is about different physical activities or um, equipment to reduce that sensory overload. You know, um, hypermobility, again, exercises, you know, it's just about having physio, um, salt, um, uh, sensory OTs, um, you know, um, proper nutrition, so dietitians, um, things like that. But again, it all costs money. And that is basically it. And in a way, you can understand why it's easier to attack a parent seeking support than it is to support a child and to focus on the parent rather than the child's needs because it comes down to money. The NHS don't have it. The local authorities don't have it. The government is removing the funding. Where are we going to go? Either we go private, which is then backdoor privatisation, which then means they can make further cuts to the NHS, which then means they can sell off the hospital lands to procure more monies, to pay off the debts. Um, or we keep fighting for an NHS that doesn't have the funding, who are failing children across the board because they don't have the funds to do it. And yet it's the comorbids that cause us the issue. We need to start helping children manage the comorbids, not make them conform, not make punish them for not being able to cope like um, your typical children, because in reality, the neurology, the biology, the physiology of a child with autism is different from a neurotypical. And genetics has got a big role to play with it. We need to start caring about these comorbids, focusing on managing the comorbids to allow the children and adults with autism to reach their potential. Stop attacking parents stop using them as an excuse to negate responsibility to children and help the children because they're the ones at the end of the day who deserve it as an adult 
you know, been there, done it, you know, what has resulted now is what's resulted. We don't want that for our children. We want them to have a better life. We want them to achieve more than we ever could because we didn't have the understanding. We didn't have the support. And our children deserve better across the board. And we need to start focus on these comorbids and start supporting these children with them and providing interventions, the assessments, the interventions, everything they need so they can reach their potential. And rather than focus on the label autism and high functioning, low functioning, whatever, start looking deeper, growing deeper, educate the parents, help the parents understand the impact of these comorbids so these children can reach their full potential in the future and have a life worth living because they deserve it. More than anything in this world, the children being born today, the children that have been born over the last 20, 30 years deserve a better future than some of us ever got.